Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about setting up a context for use within a particular call stack so you can customize the behavior of things. We might also call this environment. We might implement it through parameters or globals, a variety of things, and we'll take a look at that. Let's start out in Bash, where we have some proxy tasks being performed with some kind of mode defined by an environment variable. Our default mode is safe, but for some reliable tasks, maybe we can change the mode to run faster in a way that we can depend on because of the task we're performing. We know environment variables also often change with your user or various other needs or running tasks on your computer. So here perform something and reliable and again. And for the with mode case, I pass in the task I want to perform along with the mode I want to use. And I set the variable mode what looks like locally inside of this function, but it really is going to be active throughout this entire subshell because that's how environment variables work. So in reference mode over here and really perform, we should get this different value. And I've gone through this extra layer of perform just to represent some kind of nested call stack to execute your complicated tasks, whatever they happen to be. And in performing a task, I just print out a message that represents doing the task. And then I return a result, which is just the length of the string as proxy for some kind of actual result of a thing you actually cared about doing. So let's run it. We see here safe something, faster reliable, and safe again. Well, that faster got passed through the call stack where the function is being executed. And our results are 9, 8, and 5 for the lengths of these strings. And it's another example of dynamic scope, which is through your call stack versus the static lexical scope that you see inside of your program. Let's take a look at the venerable Lisp, where you can define dynamically scoped variables with def var. And stylistically, you wrap their names in stars. This program is the same length as my bash script if I get rid of the type assertions. Anyway, down here in main, I process something, and then with mode faster, I process something reliable. Then when I process again, I made this a list so that I can have some variety in my tasks, representing different kinds of task types. And my processing can handle either strings or lists of strings. Let's run it. And we see the same result as before, except now we have a list of again, which is length one, because there's only one item in the list. Now, for contrast, let's change this dynamically scoped variable to be a statically scoped one with let. And notice my syntax highlighting changed the coloring of the variable when I did this. If we run it now, it's just safe the whole time, because this really just becomes a local variable that has no impact on the behavior of the functions it's calling, including through the lambda here. And that's the behavior we expect from many modern languages, such as JavaScript or TypeScript. If I have some kind of semi-global up here, and I change the value of a local variable in a function, I don't expect that to carry through to a different function. It's just a local over here. So if I run this, my something with mode fast or reliable, and again, does not get that environment or that context carried through. So what could we do to make this happen? Well, one thing we could do is make our semi-global non-const. And in here, modify it. But we probably ought to reset it back to where it was before. So let's remember it. And since JavaScript is effectively single-threaded, this is approximately safe, though perhaps not in the face of different kinds of concurrent operations. And in a language that does multi-threading, perhaps you should use thread locals for this kind of behavior. So for example, I had a discussion with the creator of the C3 language while working on this video, where he pointed out the at scoped macro in C3, which lets you reset variable values. And for thread locals, it might be a useful way to control what happens down inside of your call stack, such as customizing your allocator. But here for my current example, Let's run it and see what it does. We see now faster gets through because I changed the global value. But we have interesting interaction effects between the dynamic and the static scopes. So let's try to remember what we had as our value inside of this try block. And by default, I don't care what we're remembering, just some kind of value. But in here, let's instrument a tiny bit to see what value we had captured inside of a closure. 
remember. Okay, let's run it. And we see that we remember safe, even though for only called a with mode, that value should have been faster. Because by the time I'm reporting it, that mode, which apparently is a reference in the global, has had its value reset. So if we want to actually remember what's going on here, perhaps we need to have additional variables involved and keep track of those instead. Now we see faster. Well, this is well and good, but more traditionally, when you want to keep track of some value through a call stack, you pass it through as parameters. And it might be a safer way of managing it depending on the semantics of your language and the kinds of tasks you'll be performing. So let's try that out as well. Let's go back to where you were. And invade all of our functions with a new parameter. Which of course is plenty of fun. Let's see if we can get it right. Whew, I wonder if I got it all into the right places. Let's find out. Looks like I did. But as we saw, that was very invasive in terms of the number of places we had to add an extra parameter on. And depending on what you're trying to do, that might impact the overall understanding of your program and what you're trying to convey and might in the way of your primary goals of what you're trying to accomplish. So let's reset all that back again to where we were in the first place. But in terms of passing all those variables down through as parameters through our function calls, it reminds me a bit of back in the day doing web applications and request scoped variables that would come through on your request to maintain the context or the environment of the request you're servicing. You might have seen such things web frameworks you used before as well. But to explore a bit further in the feature space of TypeScript, which is a semi-object-oriented language, let's use a custom class and see how that relates to the idea of context. So here I've made a request class, and each instance has a mode on it. So when I say perform and really perform, I'm not repeating that mode variable. And down here in main, I create various object instances with different modes or different kinds of things we're operating on, and then I just perform those tasks through those object instances. And so these methods don't say they're receiving of this, but it's implicitly there. And if we were in a language like Java or several other options, we wouldn't even have to say the this when we're calling it either. That's also just implied. In which case, nothing here is saying that you're receiving or passing of this, though it's actually really happening. If we run this, we see the same behavior where this is received implicitly, and we get our context when we're asking for the mode. So let's take advantage of that in original TypeScript program, because in TypeScript, every function called function has an implicit this on it, even if it's not inside of a class. For this to work, we'll have to turn our action function down here into a function function instead of the arrows that don't have a this on them. Okay, that's sort of exciting so far. And the syntax in JavaScript for passing of this down is the dot syntax. If I say request.action, that means request is getting passed in as the this into my function. But this right here has no dot in it, so I have to use a different way of passing down the this, and that's with the call method. And so I'm not explicitly receiving a this on my functions, it's implicit, but I'm explicitly passing it in because that's the way it works here. Implicit receiving, explicit passing. And then down here, I want to use it. I may or may not have a this because what if I'm just calling it directly? And I'll default to the global. Let's run it and see how it does. And we get the behavior we wanted. What type is this? It says any. Hmm. Well, Technically, in TypeScript, you're allowed to type your this if you want to. And I could say this is something that has a mode on it. And now I'm explicitly typed, but I'm also explicitly receiving a parameter. So at some level, it might be less exciting. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish.
but just trying to explore this idea of implicitly passed parameters, whether a this to functions or inside of classes and implicit this is that might exist in JavaScript or Java or other languages out there. Let's take a look at a different language though that treats context differently, and that's Jai. In Jai, all of your procedures by default receive a context parameter, sort of like your implicit this in some object-oriented languages. And you add things to that context structure with that add context directive. And I'm defaulting my mode to being safe. And in my with mode procedure, I'm pushing a new context onto the stack, which is automatically popped, sort of like that at scoped thing we saw in C3. Only my understanding is that the context is actually being passed as an implicit parameter through all my procedures. Here I copy my context, push it on, and now I'm modifying the new context so it doesn't affect the code afterward. Let's run it. And we see here the behavior we expect. And unfortunately, I had to make an overload for perform for my two different options. Otherwise, I had trouble getting Jai to infer correctly what kind of task type I had across the generic with mode. Anyway, so having seen push context and add context in Jai, let's compare that to Odin, which we did a little bit in my last video as well, but we're digging a little bit deeper today. Odin does not have the add context directive. Instead, the context is defined statically in the standard library, but we do have a user pointer and user index fields to do with as we see fit. And you might use this just for very controlled local contexts. Or in my case, I'm pretending I'm going to have this instruct always there as the user pointer throughout the whole thing. And down here inside of with mode, I copy my environment into a new struct on the stack here, modify it, and store the pointer to that. In this context, unlike in Jai, I don't push and pop it. It's just assumed that's what you want to do by default when you modify. So only within this call stack is context changed. And so it's okay if env also lives only on the stack frame as well. And I also had a little bit of trouble with inference across my with mode in Odin. Anyway, let's run it. And we see the behavior we expect. Now for a completely different look at things, let's try Coca. Coca is an effect handling language where instead of just saying I return an int from a function, for example, I say I return an int, but it's dependent on effects console for print line or env, which I defined to track the mode. And I suspect my env is implicitly a parameter here as well, but it doesn't look like it. Down inside of main, I define the mode for my env effect, and then I do the same kinds of tasks as in other languages. And here I don't mention that I'm sending or receiving my environment, but for any function up above that handles env, I have to declare it. So if you remember, in JavaScript, I explicitly pass the this, but I implicitly receive it. In Coca, I'm not explicitly passing it, but I am stating that it receives it in some fashion. Sort of the opposite of JavaScript with this. Anyway, instead of my with mode here, I update to the new mode value, and I have to declare my action as working with the env effect. I sort of thought it would be that I declare with mode as handling env, but this is how it worked out. And my pipe E on the end here is polymorphic effects. It means whatever other effects action has, with mode has the same effects, which is why I don't declare console explicitly, but since perform does console, it means with mode also has console in this context. Let's run it. And we see the behavior we expect. Unfortunately, I also had trouble getting my generics to work here, and I've repeated my functions for the two types of list string and string, although with mode itself was able to be generic. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. Anyway, let's move on to Scala. Scala 2 had the term implicit in it for declaring implicit parameters. But here in Scala 3, we use given to state we have an implicit value, and using to state we're implicitly using it. And this overall notion is called context in Scala. So here in main, it looks an awful lot like in Coca, and our with mode receives a function that takes context parameters rather than ordinary ones, such that my updated environment is getting implicitly passed in. But all of these defined functions do indicate again that they're using an environment implicitly. We're not explicit in our passing, but we are explicit in our receiving. And for reference, this was just a version that I made up on my own from reading the docs. And this was a shorter version recommended by someone on the Scala Discord. Another recommendation on the Scala Discord was to make it more statically typed with an enum, and your code ended up looking like this down here. Meanwhile, let's move on to Haskell, where our implicit parameters are also indicated by a question mark, such as we saw here in Scala. Maybe those syntaxes are related. But the other interesting thing in Scala here is that our generic type constraints go in the same syntactic position as our implicit parameters. 
on the left side of our fat arrows. This is receiving either a list of cares, or a string rather, or a list of strings. List of cares, or list of strings. But the item has to be printable, or showable rather, so that I can print it. And we see here in the same position our implicit parameter for our environment, which we can define to default to save, or update for use in our action, that is declared also to be, with our fat arrow, a function that's receiving implicitly an environment. Let's run it. Again, behaves as expected. But I want to focus again on this issue that the type constraints for my generic types, aka my type parameters, and my implicit parameters go in the same place. And we see this even further in the language Idris, which in the time I spent, I had trouble getting building and working correctly, so I don't demo it today. We see here that there are const generics in this dependently typed language, such as the length of your vector, or the type stored inside your vector, all look the same as generic type parameters, but they're all called implicit arguments in Idris, because the language treats them as being the same thing. You can be explicit with them, or they can be inferred implicitly. And here in Haskell, we see such type parameters implied via lowercase names. In Scala, we see them as explicit parameters between square brackets. In Coca, they're single letters. In Odin and Jai, they're marked with dollar signs. And in TypeScript and some other common languages, we have angle brackets to indicate our generic parameters. So these really are parameters that have values that are being evaluated at compile time. Someone figures out the value for what kind of task we're dealing with. And in TypeScript's case, they infer that we have a string being passed in for perform, but we never set it. We explicitly receive it, but we implicitly pass it. Same thing for perform down here. It's an array of strings being passed in. I can be explicit if I want to, or just leave it as an implicit parameter. Or in other words, when we're using special syntax to tell the compiler to implicitly grab a value, which is a type in this case, at compile time to customize this function, we are using implicit parameters that are passed automatically through our call stack. For perform here, it calls a really perform of string. For perform here, it calls a really perform of array of string. So you might have been using implicit parameters this whole time without realizing it, just in a different kind and a different part of your compiler operation. Anyway, I hope this has been fun. Maybe we can look more at these languages and or features in the future. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye, y'all.